For Lauren Booth, it was this spiritual feeling that overwhelmed her only last year when she sat down amongst the women and children in a busy mosque in the city of Qom in Iran. It was as if I had been injected with morphine. I've had morphine for operations. Anybody who's had a pre-med will know what I mean. I was no longer... I was just in contact with absolute peace. And I felt the tightness in my chest that we carry around, the stress had gone, the list, I must do this tomorrow and don't forget to do that. There was silence. For the first time in my adult life, there was silence. I slept the night on the floor of the mosque, woke up in the morning and did the prayer, went outside to take some fresh air and went, oh my God, Islam, you've got to be kidding me. But how did you... <laughs> How did you know that that spiritual enlightenment, that moment that you had, that that was a call to a religion? Surely that could have just been a wonderful moment of peace and relaxation. Absolutely, and I was hoping it was. I was like, okay, that was nice, thanks very much, good to see you, bye, back to my old life now. And then a quiet voice inside me said, why are you trying to push away the most beautiful feeling you've ever had? Why don't you just go along your life but be aware of this feeling. I find it difficult, though, that you had this moment of enlightenment in Iran, which has a terrible record on human rights abuses, particularly when it comes to women. This has nothing to do with the perception of Iran and the way things are run there. This is to do with the connection between Alice Apano Atala and a person that has been given the chance to have a connection. But as a journalist, I think I would be very concerned about what was going on politically. Did that never go through your mind? See, this is a secularist argument, though. You're not accepting that faith is one tier above human experience. I couldn't think about anything else. And the words, uh, Allahu Akbar, subhanAllah, subhanAllah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, were like in a loop on a stuck tape around my brain until the day I said shahada. Welcome to the Islamic Bazaar. The most stylish girls, they have the little headband with the hijab. And then sometimes you'll see these huge updos, almost like an elaborate hairdo with the scarves. And two tones, so two different coloured scarves sort of wrapped around. It's quite an exciting part of being a Muslim, you learning your own hijab style. Is cool. well, I was going to say that, you look really excited I about love that. it, I love it, it's great. <laughs> it's like handbags or shoes, and it's great. Fatiha <laughs> Iman. But as Miriam Francois Sarah told me for this BBC programme, wearing the hijab has not been so light-hearted. The approach that I had to the headscarf fits in very much with a feminist desire to understand why any woman would want to cover herself and cover her hair. Liberation, I think, from a feminist perspective in the European context was very much about removing all of this stuff which was holding us back from experiencing life. Now, I think that's a very different way to the way in which Muslims understand modesty. Muslims say modesty is a means to minimise the extent to which there is a focus on the externality and a way in which to focus on the internal, what's substantive, what's real, your values, your soul, who you are as a human being, and not allow ourselves, I think, as a society to fetishise beauty of the female form. And so I began to see things through that lens. Now, for me, I don't see the headscarf as hugely important. You're a Muslim, whether you wear a headscarf or not, the headscarf is sort of the cherry on the cake for me in terms of my aspirations, but it it would still be a cake if you didn't have a cherry on top. Well, what's the reaction when people see a white woman wearing a scarf? The primary reaction typically is that people don't recognise me as being white. You are no longer of the white category. You enter the non-white category in which you discover how the rest of the world live. In other words, to my mind, you become a second-class citizen. What was extremely tough for me was walking into shops and cafes and restaurants that I'd gone to for years and suddenly being looked upon with disdain or having service refused to me. This has happened in France. And I think that that's reflective of a large degree of racism, Islamophobia, of this tutor system which we're in denial about, frankly. Have your parents accepted your conversion or were they dismayed? I think the question I would ask back is would most parents in this country rather their child went on to become a Hollywood actress or would they rather she became religious let alone Muslim I understand that it's not every parent's dream for their little girl 
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين. I was probably the last one to know. And the first question that my sister asked was, "Will you still drink?" And then she said no, and we both said, "Yippee!" Lauren Booth's eight-year-old daughter Holly has her own dreams. I asked, "Will you still smoke?" She said, "No, I'm not going to smoke either." My sister asked the last question, and it was the funniest question of all. Will you still be our mummy? And mummy said yes, and made her laugh a lot because she was still, of course, going to be our mum. But we were really glad that she stopped smoking and drinking because before we are hardly got to spend any time with her as well because she'd always be going out with her friends and things. Do you think that you'll convert one day? Yes, I hope so. Holly's ten-year-old sister Alexandra has already converted. I asked Lauren if young girls are capable of making such an important decision, or had they just been influenced by her? When children see any positive change in their lives, they should want to mimic it because they know it's good for them. So when they saw me praying five times a day, they saw a peace come about the household. They wanted to copy that. But I have to say. They actually, ethically, and on a very kind of deep spiritual level, are on a higher level of Islam than I am. They understand the ethics, and they have a connection with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala that is absolutely nothing to do with me, and sometimes takes my breath away. For example, Alexandra coming to me last week without any pressing at all on my part. Quite the opposite. I'm saying slowly, slowly, saying, "Mum, when I'm eleven, I'm going to wear hijab because it's the right thing to do." That that's not me. What about the reaction of your family and your mother, particularly? My mum's an Islamophobe, so that was never going to be an easy sell. But I told her the feeling that I had in the mosque, and she was crying and said, "Wow, that's amazing! I've always wanted peace in my life, and you've been touched by something. I really respect that." I said, "Really, mum? I'm thinking of converting to Islam," and she said, "I back you a hundred percent." I thought, "Mashallah." God's really helping with this one. So the next week, I saw my mum, and I had a scarf on my head, and she said, "What are you wearing that for?" And I said, "Remember, I talked about converting to Islam. I'm a Muslim." She went, "Muslim? I thought you meant Buddhism." What those bloody nutters? <laughs> Sorry for swearing, but that's what she said. And I said, "Yes, mum, those nutters." Then I just started being a good daughter because Islam shows you the mother is everything. She's carried you for nine months. She's nurtured you. You're going to have a really tough time with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala if you don't make it right. And I have to say, for the first time in my life, I have a mother and she has a daughter. And everyone will want to know what your brother-in-law Tony Blair thinks of your conversion as a Middle East peace envoy. I really don't care what he thinks, and in Islam, it's perfectly clear that you must stand for what is right, even if it means、uh, standing against your own family. Yeah, I think initially they both sort of thought it was a phase. She'll go through a phase, and then she'll be Christian again, and it'll be fine. And as it went longer, and I didn't grow out of the phase or whatever, it became difficult. Conversion also spelt family trouble for Fatah Iman. We don't live close to each other. They haven't seen how happy I am in my daily life. They haven't seen the positive effects that it's had on me. They've only seen a very small part of it when I visited, and they don't understand the decision and they don't agree with the decision. And as parents, they're really worried about me being in this strange alien thing that they've only ever heard very negative things about, and that. Creates problems because as an adult, I feel like you know I'm an adult. I've made a decision. I'm sensible. You know, I'm not going to let myself get caught up in something that puts me at risk. But to them, I'm still I'm still their little girl, and they're still worried. And sometimes I think they just can't see past that. Why are they worried about the man you want to marry, your fiance? From my father's point of view, his idea of Muslim men and of Islam as a religion and the role that women play in that religion is very negative. His concern is that I'll just be a servant in the house, that I'll make get beaten, that I might be mistreated, and you know the problem. He hasn't met my fiance. Has he? Has he wanted to meet him? I'm, I'm trying to sort of organise them to meet. It's been quite difficult because my fiance from the Asian background, you don't approach the bride's family until you have a job and some money, and then you go very formally and you say, "I have a job and some money, and I can support a wife here. I would like to marry your daughter." Whereas from the English point of view. It's a different process. You date the daughter for a while, and then after, when it gets serious, you meet the parents, and then you say, "Sir, I'd like to propose to your daughter." And he goes, "Yes, of course you may." And then you buy a ring and you do it like that. So there's this huge cultural difference in the way that it works, 
so my fiance is going, I need to have a job first. When I have a job, I'm going to go and speak to your dad in a very formal way. And my dad's going, why don't I know the man that wants to marry you? I don't understand what's going on. Two trains going in opposite directions. Eventually, they're going to meet each other, right? And then they're going to talk to each other, hopefully. And then hopefully, they're going to like each other and it's all going to be fine. Is your fiance a British citizen? Does that have an impact on your father's view of him? Definitely, I think it has a negative view because he's not actually British. He's a Pakistani national and came here to study. So now obviously the first thing people say is, oh, he wants your passport. You know, well, there's other ways to get a passport. Actually, it's easier for him to just apply the normal route. But, but that's always the misunderstanding. And I, I'm sure that my parents have thought about it. And I'm sure that's a fear. Fatah Iman is not alone. Many converts find it takes a long time for family and friends to accept their new identity, if ever. But this isn't the only problem Kevin Bryce of the University of Wales discovered during his research. First of all, there's the feeling of isolation, the fact that at times they no longer fit into their old lifestyle, but also that there's a lack of acceptance amongst born Muslims, pressures exerted on them to adopt the cultural norms of born Muslims. My first experience of going into a mosque near my parents' home was uh, being shooed out of the main entrance and being told to, you know, go over there and through the back entrance by the bins where the women were supposed to go in, into a windowless room with no fan, listening to the Friday sermon on a speaker which was intermittent so that what we were actually hearing was and men, women should and had absolutely no clue what he was talking about. So it absolutely was a culture shock because of course I learned about Islam in a very theoretical fashion. I learned about Islam from books and so the view that I had of it was, dare I say it, idealistic and rosy and perfect. And yet, sometimes I'd encounter people who were so far removed from that that I didn't feel at home. Miriam Francois Serra. Fatah Iman had to negotiate her way among some very strict members of her new community. You will find people who go, all women should be in the niqab. Everybody needs to wear a veil. And a few voices like that. I live right next door to this huge, beautiful, purpose-built new mosque. I'm not allowed in. There's no ladies, but they're all like, oh, we don't need to let the ladies in the mosque. Have you thought about going up and knocking on the door and saying, let me in? It's a bit tempting to sort of bang the door down and go, look, I spoke to a scholar. He said you should let me in, so I'm going to pray in the back somewhere. You know what you're going to get? A lot of old men staring at you. Why is she here? You know, a panic going round that there's a woman in the mosque. People cling on to that old cultural idea, and as Islam in Britain becomes more British and starts to absorb converts and people from different backgrounds, it starts to change. It's changing, and you're seeing now people are going, yeah, why not? Let's have a women's bit. Go for it. What's the worst that could happen? Acceptance of Muslim women is still some way off, whether it's in the mosque or, as Miriam Francois Serra told me, for this edition of Heart and Soul from the BBC World Service, in TV and film. Miriam's decision to wear a headscarf and dress modestly has taken its toll on the career she loves. The pool of parts is a lot smaller than it was. Moving into the adult genre was something that I already had a great deal of anxiety with. I used to share it with my parents. I was saying, well, this part's come along, but it's got a sex scene. And frankly, that's to me degrading and humiliating and not something I would be happy with. What about showing your hair? Would you show your hair on camera? No, I wouldn't, because for me, that remains within the level of dress that I maintain outside, you know, when I... But that's going to make it very difficult in most roles, I would say. I think there are ways around it. I do think that we'll gradually see more and more diversity on screen. I mean, the Doctor in the series will just happen to be wearing a headscarf. She'll just happen to be a Muslim. And you know what? It doesn't need to be part of the storyline. The plot doesn't need to be about a forced marriage. She can just happen to be a Muslim doctor, letting Muslims be the same as anybody else's and not making them into these reified identities in which the only thing that can affect Muslims are Muslim issues.